respect and death to all you crackers, man. That's right. Oh, that's right. I want to back your head in, man. That's right. Oh, they're the young. They're the young. I want to take these babies and they don't even I hate you devils, man. A modern religious phenomenon has taken place in the United States. Black African men have formed groups claiming they are the true Israelites and that the Ashkenazi Jews in Israel and abroad are imposters. There are different black Israelite splinter groups. Some believe Jesus is the Messiah and others do not. Some claim the white man is the devil and cannot be saved, and others do not. But what they all agree on is they are supposedly the true Israelites of the Bible. In this film, we will refute the biblical and historical claims of these groups. In 1960, an African-American named Eber Ben Yamyan, also known as Abba Bivens, formed a black Israelite school in New York City. There he started teaching the idea that Jesus was a black man and that African-Americans and Native Americans were the true Israelites. Prior to his death in 1973, he appointed Moshe Ben Karim, also known as Masha, as well as Peter Sherrod also known as Jacob, to take over leadership of this school. The school would become known as ISUPK, or Israelite School of Universal Practical Knowledge. Prior to joining this new school, Peter Sherrod, or Jacob, claimed to have learned blacks were the true Israelites from an angel in a bar in the Midwest. He claimed this angel appeared as a man and had a perfect afro, told him blacks were the Israelites, left the bar, and then when Yaikob ran outside to catch him and talk some more, the angel mysteriously vanished without a trace. This is interesting because leaders of many cults and false religions often purport to have encounters with angelic beings who lead them to create their false systems. For example, Muhammad claimed the angel Gabriel appeared to him to start Islam. Joseph Smith claimed the angel Moroni appeared to him to start Mormonism, and Benjamin Krem claimed an angelic figure appeared to him to create his version of the false New Age movement. But as 2 Corinthians 11.14 warns, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Later in the 1970s, five more black men were added to the leadership of the school so that the group was headed by the seven. This group then adopted the teaching of reincarnation. They claimed their leader Masha had several reincarnations as Moses, King David, and the Apostle Peter. It also taught that one of its leaders, Ariah, was John the Revelator, reincarnated, etc. They said this because Ariah was the one who came up with a lot of black Hebrew Israelite doctrine. Now, as time passed, the leaders Masha and Ariah had a falling out. Some of the members of ISUPK attempted a coup against Masha and even put a hit out on him in the streets. 
So, Mashal left the group and started the House of David school. Arya remained at ISUPK, and one of the members of that group, named Tazadakia, ended up making the insane and heretical claim that he was actually the promised comforter or Holy Spirit of John 14 in the flesh. He changed the name of ISUPK into the Israelite Church of God in Jesus Christ, or ICGJC, due to some failed prophecies which embarrassed the group. We will cover those false prophecies shortly. Now, Arya, the one who made the false prophecies, remained with this renamed ICGJC group, supporting Tazadakia's claim of being the Holy Spirit. Arya also ended up denying the virgin birth of Jesus and claiming that the beginning of the Gospel of Luke was a forgery since it affirms that doctrine. Their ICGJC group also denies the doctrine of the Trinity. General Yahana was part of this renamed ICGJC group, but ended up leaving and creating another group which retained the original ISUPK name. His group still exists today and is quite large. Another ICGJC member named Elder Rasha also left the group after the aforementioned failed prophecies and created the Gathering of Christ Church School, or GOCC, which still exists today. This group says that Gentiles like whites can be saved, while the other schools say they cannot. Now, Tahar, who was a leader of the House of David Splinter Group, which was at odds with the original ISUPK group, started teaching the false doctrines that the Gentile Cornelius in the Book of Acts was actually an Israelite and that the black Hebrew Israelites could rape young girls based on a distortion and misunderstanding of Deuteronomy 22. So what happens when one of y'all feels so overwhelmed by the Spirit of God that when you see one of each other's daughters, you just grab her up? You gonna tell one of these brothers here? Come on, you know the doctrine. You know how it get when you get... Well, well, answer it, answer it, answer it. We just told you that... that so if it did happen, hold on, if it now, did happen, on. but if it did happen, you would let allow it to happen. Why? Yeah. Because you go back to the scriptures. You're supposed to be a brother. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You, you gonna allow that. one of your brothers to rape Wait. your daughter. Look, man. When the kingdom is established, we're going to get women when they 12 years old. Right. All right? Say it again. Question. Have sex with them. Have babies, man. No. With 12-year-olds. Brother, there's this. In the kingdom, we're going to do that, man. We're going to get them young. <laughs> this caused major divisions and arguments within the House of David school he was a part of. Tahar was therefore kicked out and formed his own group called Great Millstone Israelites, or GMS, which still exists today. Moreover, according to former members, people within the House of David group accused its leader Mesha of dabbling in Satanism, Kabbalah, and the incantation of demons. They said he was trying to control demons and get them to go after his enemies. They say this might have been due to dementia and old age, however. After this, the Israel United in Christ, or IUIC, group split off from the House of David. This school is headed up by people like Elder Nathaniel and was created in 2003. You will see them wearing purple. So black Hebrew Israelites are indeed a fragmented group with a wide array of different camps and beliefs. As for the false prophecy we mentioned earlier that led to the original ISUPK group to change its name, that is important to discuss. Various leaders of ISUPK, such as Arya, falsely predicted Jesus was going to return in the year 2000 and murder and enslave all white people. God is going to send his decree in these last days and that is to totally annihilate America. America will be blown off the face of the earth by the year 2000. It's talking about judgment day. These places that's going to be hit in the thermonuclear war is America. America is going to be wiped off the face of the planet Earth. That's going to take place before the year 2000. That's right. America has less than 628 days before this country is taken out and thermonuclear destruction. America is going to be destroyed before the year 2000 by thermonuclear destruction. When examining the history of this movement, we see its foundations were bad. And as Matthew 7, 17 to 18 says, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit, end quote. 
This movement is indeed a bad tree. Fake black Israelites teach that unless you are an African American Negro belonging to the tribe of Judah, or a member of one of the other tribes, you cannot be saved. Therefore, it is important to prove the ancient Israelites were not Negroes to refute this theology. Fake black Israelites claim they descend from Noah's son Shem. Shem's son Arphaxad was the ancestor of the Hebrews and Israelites. The question is if Arphaxad's later Hebrew and Israelite progeny were indeed Negroes as fake black Israelites claim. We will demonstrate they were not. Now Noah had another son named Ham and Ham's son Cush was actually the true ancestor of the Negroes or Africans, including fake black Israelites of today. Ham's son Cush was the ancestor of the Cushites. The Cushites who inhabited the land of Cush were the ancient Negroes. This land also went by the name of Nubia or Ethiopia in ancient times. Although fake black Israelites quote an outdated and mistaken Zondervan pictorial Bible dictionary to say that Ham did not produce the Negroes, the fact is that book nowhere says the Negroes come from Shem. In fact, this book denies that and says Shem was the progenitor of the Semitic race. And plus, modern high-level scholars affirm that Ham's son Cush was indeed the progenitor of the Negroes. For example, in his study of ancient peoples in the work From Every People and Nation, biblical scholar J. Daniel Hayes observes, the Cushites were clearly black African people with classic Negroid features. Thus, Ham's son Cush was indeed the progenitor of the Negroes. Noah's son Shem was not. The same work goes on to explain. W. Hayes writes in the Cambridge Ancient History that the art of Egypt clearly identified the Nubian Kushite group as Negro. Other physical features are discussed in the ancient sources as well. The Kushites were described as having not only black skin, but also flat noses, thick lips, and woolly hair. Notice even the African American scholar of classics Frank Snowden agrees that it was the Kushites, that is the descendants of Ham, who were the ancient Negroes according to Egyptian art and other ancient sources. The Oxford Guide to People and Places in the Bible notes, Cush in Hebrew and Ethiopia in Greek designate the land and people of the Upper Nile River from modern southern Egypt into Sudan. The more indigenous term for this region is Nubia. Ham is another Hebrew term for the dark-hued people of antiquity. In Genesis 10, Ham is the son of Noah who populates Africa, end quote. Ham populated Africa with Negroes. Shem did not produce the Negroes. So indeed, fake black Israelites come from Ham's son Cush. Yet, when street preaching, the fake black Israelites often criticize and distance themselves from modern day Africans who come from Ham's son Cush as well. Do you, what, 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 Why what did about, you say that? Why did you say that you wouldn't kick my ass? You can kick my ass. If you kick me, you kick yourself. No, but I'm, I'm, not, whole, African. I'm, I'm not African. African. I'm, I'm not African. African. I'm not African. I'm not African. I'm not African. Good for you. Let me ask you a question. Good for you. Let me ask you. They from Israel. They from Israel. I'm from. I was born in Africa. Man, I'm from Africa. Raised. They from Israel. We are not. Africans, we two separate people. The Africans are a disgusting people, man. I need to put a picture of how disgusting African culture is, so my people would separate from Africans. My people are not African. My people are the Negroes. Yet, as we've shown, both the African and the African American are Hamite or Cushite Negro Gentiles. Abraham, who is the father of the Hebrews and Israelites, came from the line of Shem's son Arphaxad. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not from Cush, the ancestors of the Negroes. Instead, according to the ancient records, Abraham lived in western Mesopotamia, that is the land of the Arameans. J. Daniel Hayes gives the evidence. In Genesis 24.4 and 28.5, 
Abraham is associated with the Arameans. The use of Aramean in connection with Abraham probably refers to those scattered tribes of people in Upper Mesopotamia who had not yet coalesced into the nation of Aram that appears in later texts. The creed-like statement of Deuteronomy 26.5, My father was a wandering Aramean, certainly remembers an Aramean ancestry. The text probably refers to Jacob and not Abraham. Jacob's mother and his two wives are identified as Arameans in Genesis 28.5. The Arameans Abraham and his family came from lived in settlements in what is now modern-day Syria which is quite the distance from the area south of Egypt the ancient Negroid Cushites populated. Now, Jacob's sons formed the 12 tribes of Israel. He and his sons' families were not Negroes. Instead, as Hayes relays, although both Isaac and Jacob returned to Mesopotamia to marry Aramean women, Jacob's sons apparently do not follow this tradition. Judah marries a Canaanite woman, and then also fathers twins, Perez and Zerah, by his daughter-in-law, Tamar, who is probably also a Canaanite. Genesis 46.10 indicates that Simeon likewise had a Canaanite wife. Joseph, after becoming the advisor of Pharaoh, married an Egyptian woman named Asenath, who bore him two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Thus, the biblical tradition presents the ancestors of the tribes of Israel as a mix of Western Mesopotamian, Aramean and or Amorite, Canaanite and Egyptian, end quote. Abraham, Jacob, Judah, and Judah's Canaanite wife were thus Asiatics. In the context of ancient Egypt, Asiatic just meant beyond the borders of Egypt and Africa to the east. Here are depictions of ancient Asiatics from the tomb of Kunamhotep II from 1900 BC. Clearly, they were not Negroes. Compare these Asiatic men to ancient Egyptian depictions of Negro Nubians, and you can see that they do not look the same. Also, the Egyptian Book of Gates depictions, dated to the 13th century BC, likewise demonstrate Asiatics like Abraham, Jacob, Judah, and Judah's Canaanite wife were not Negroes. What is more, the tomb of Seti I proves the same. The Asiatic people were not Negroes. Well, what about the later Israelites themselves? Hayes provides more insight into how the later ancient Israelites looked. He notes they combined the look of the current inhabitants of the Middle East with the representations of the Israelites and other Asiatic peoples in the paintings and monument carvings of the Egyptians and the Assyrians. As mentioned above, numerous Asiatics are depicted in Egyptian art from the Old Testament period. Likewise, numerous Israelites are portrayed in Assyrian sculpture. Jehu, king of Israel, along with several other Israelites, is depicted in the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III. Numerous scenes portraying Israelites are included in the sculptured wall panels from Sennacherib's palace, portraying the siege of the Israelite city of Lachish. The people in these artistic portrayals are, in general, similar in appearance to the Israelis and Arabs living in and around Israel-Palestine today. Indeed, here is the aforementioned ancient Assyrian depiction of the Israelite king Jehu bowing to the Assyrian king Shalmaneser III in the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, created about 825 BC. Notice the Israelite king has long straight hair and a hook nose, which is not how ancient Negroes were depicted. Ancient Cushites had flat noses and kinky hair. On the same obelisk behind King Jehu are a line of Israelite tribute carriers, and they are not Negro in appearance either. Notice they have straight hair on their heads and the bottom of their beards. This is how the ancient Israelites looked. They were not Negroes. Also, here is the aforementioned Lachish relief on the walls of Sennacherib's palace. These are stone panels carved around 700 BC, depicting Assyrians conquering the Israelite kingdom of Judah in the siege of Lachish. Notice how the Judean people look. They do not have Negro facial features at all. But don't some of the men in this relief appear Negro? Yes, but these were not the Judeans. 
These were Nubian or Kushite troops who fought side by side the Judeans to defend the town of Lachish and were made prisoners by King Sennacherib with the Judeans. The Judeans in the relief have turbans and fringed kilts and the Nubians do not. Indeed, here is an image showing a Judean man and his family and then a Nubian in front of them all being captured and led away from Lachish. The Nubian Negro is clearly different than the Judean man and his family. Thus, when fake black Israelites claim the curly-haired Nubians in the relief are the Judeans, they are deceiving people. Shem's descendants, the ancient Israelites, were not Negroes. Further evidence the ancient Israelites were not Negro can be seen in Numbers 12.1, which shows Moses' brother Aaron and his sister Miriam got upset that Moses married a Negro woman, quote, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman, end quote. Scholars note the Cushites were, as we've already noted, black Africans. For example, biblical scholar J. Daniel Hayes notes, it is clear that Moses marries a black African woman, end quote. Likewise, Yamauchi notes, the Cushite woman was no doubt dark-skinned, end quote. Hence, the reason Aaron and Miriam spoke against Moses marrying a Cushite was because she was black and the Israelites were not. If Moses, Aaron, and Miriam were all black, Aaron and Miriam would not object to Moses marrying a black woman. Therefore, the ancient Israelites like Moses were not black. Because of this racial prejudice against blacks from Moses' brother and sister, Numbers 12.10 goes on to tell us that God got angry and gave Miriam leprosy, turning her skin extreme ghost white as a punishment, quote, when the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow, and Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was leprous, end quote. This further confirms Moses, Aaron, and Miriam were not Negroes, but instead Aaron and Miriam got corrected by God for being prejudiced against Negroes. This is confirmed by Old Testament scholar and Hebraist Stephen L. McKenzie, who in the Oxford Guide to People and Places in the Bible notes, Miriam's becoming as white as snow with leprosy seems appropriately ironic punishment for her criticism of Moses' marriage to a black woman, end quote. Hence Moses and the Israelites were not Negroes, and the racial prejudice exhibited by Aaron and Miriam was also unacceptable. Another proof Israelites were not black or Negro is found in Jeremiah 13.23 which says, Can the Cushite change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then also you can do good who are accustomed to do evil." End quote. Now if Jeremiah and the Israelites were Negroes like the Cushites, then why would the skin of the Cushites be emphasized in this peculiar manner? So if Jeremiah and the Israelites were black like Cushites, then wouldn't Jeremiah just say, can the Israelite change his skin? What is more, a Jewish synagogue dated to 244 AD, located in Dura Europo, Syria, yields wall depictions of ancient Israelites, and they are brown-skinned Middle Eastern and lack Negroid features. For example, the synagogue contains the Crossing the Red Sea painting, and the Ezra reading the law painting. These further prove the ancient Israelites were not Negro. Other depictions there, such as the King Saul anointing King David picture, also show the Israelites were brown-skinned Middle Eastern and not black Negroes. Fake black Israelites claim the ancient Egyptians were Negro, and since the Israelites, Moses and Jesus, blended in with Egyptians in two biblical stories, they claim the Israelites must have therefore been Negro, too. They note in Exodus 2, Moses as a baby is abandoned by his Levite mother, put in a basket in the river, discovered by the daughter of the Egyptian pharaoh, and then adopted by the Egyptians. Based on the false assumption the ancient Egyptians were Negro, the fake black Israelite writer Elisha Israel thus argues, the daughters of Ruel mistook Moses for an Egyptian. Furthermore, if the Israelites appeared unlike the Egyptians, 
Moses would have been unable to live among the household of the Pharaoh that sought the death of all the newly born Israelite males, just as Jesus was hidden among the Egyptian population during the days of Herod." End quote. So the question is, were the ancient Egyptians Negroes? Based on examining ancient Egyptian anthropology, mummies, sculptures, paintings, and inscriptions, serious scholars have come to the conclusion the ancient Egyptians were not Negroes. For example, respected Japanese Semitic historian and ancient languages scholar Edwin M. Yamauchi notes, Egyptians accurately depicted their enemies and their allies. They made clear color distinctions between themselves and the black Nubians, whom they rhetorically denounced with insulting epithets." End quote. Indeed, here is ancient Egyptian art showing how Egyptians depicted themselves as light brown-skinned people compared to how they depicted Nubians or Kushites as black-skinned Negro people. Clearly there is a difference which proves the ancient Egyptians were not Negroes. The Hamite Kushites were. In other ancient Egyptian art, for example at the tomb of Horenheb, Nubian Negro prisoners are depicted with standard Negro features such as larger lips and noses, while the Egyptian masters have smaller lips and noses. Moreover, a painting from the tomb of Hui shows Negro Nubians bringing tribute to the Egyptian pharaoh. Egyptians are also in the scene as chariot drivers, and the differences between the Egyptians and Nubian Negroes are clear. Notice the Negroes are darker than the Egyptians, and the Egyptians have long straight hair, which is not a Negro feature. Also, in an ancient Egyptian relief of a Nubian prisoner, from the New Kingdom housed in the St. Louis Art Museum. You see how the ancient Egyptians depicted ancient Negro Nubians, and it was not the same as how they depicted themselves. What is more, the wooden chest of Tutankhamun, created between 1417 and 1379 BC, depicts the Egyptian king defeating Kushite Nubians. Clearly the Egyptian king is brown-skinned and not Negro, while the Kushite Nubians were Negroes, being a lot darker. The lips of the Kushite Nubian enemies are fuller as well. All of these depictions demonstrate the ancient Egyptians were not Negroes, and they refute the fake black Israelite appeal to the Zondervan Pictorial Bible Dictionary, which denies Ham's son Cush was the progenitor of the Negroes. J. Daniel Hayes concluded that in the delta and northern part of Egypt, the majority of the Egyptians, quote, appeared as they are portrayed in Egyptian art, with straight black hair and light brown skin. Undoubtedly, however, there were other people in the society, both Asiatics and Kushites, who looked different but were nonetheless Egyptians." End quote. Hence, this was a mixed society, with the majority being light brown-skinned native Egyptians. In regards to this light brown-skinned majority in ancient Egypt, Professor of Old Testament Robert A. Bennett explains, quote, in terms of the physical and racial characteristics, the Egyptians of the ancient Near East were brown-skinned people with long hair." End quote. Moreover, on this brown-skinned majority, Egyptologist Anne Macy Roth notes, As we know from their observant depictions of foreigners, the ancient Egyptians saw themselves as darker than Asiatics and Libyans, and lighter than the Nubians, Negroes, and with different facial features and body types than any of these groups." End quote. Classic scholar Frank Snowden, who is an African American by the way, notes ancient Egyptians were a lot lighter than black Ethiopians, and also mildly lighter than half-breeds who lived between Egypt and Ethiopia. Quote, Those dwelling near the boundaries between Egypt and Ethiopia were not completely black but were half-breeds as to color, in part not so black as Ethiopians, but in part blacker than the Egyptians." End quote. Snowden also notes the ancient Egyptians were not Negroes, but instead they depicted Nubians as Negroes. Quote, Though not very numerous, the realistic portrayals of blacks in early Egyptian art are sufficient to illustrate the types of Kushites known prior to the New Kingdom and to show that Nehesu, a word used of Southerners as early as 2300 BC, included peoples with Negroid features." End quote. The 13th century BC Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II reigned during the 19th dynasty. 
His preserved mummified corpse shows he was not a Negro. As Egyptologist Frank Yerko notes, he is a typical Northern Egyptian. He came from the northeasternmost gnome of Egypt. He had fine, wavy hair, a prominent hooked nose, and moderately thin lips." End quote. In fact, the mummy of Ramses II shows he had straight, ginger hair. These are not Negro features. We also have the mummy of Thutmos IV, who reigned from 1419 to 1386 BC. He had straight long hair, untypical of ancient and modern Negroes. Now, fake black Israelites often falsely claim the Egyptian Queen Tia was Negro, based on an ancient sculpture of her head, which they interpret to have an afro. However, that is not an afro, but instead just a kerchief headdress known as a kat, K-H-A-T. We know this for a fact because we have the actual mummy of this Queen Tia, and in reality, she had long straight hair and facial features untypical of Negroes. For example, she had a hook nose instead of a flat nose, as well as smaller sized lips. What is more, we have the mummy of King Tut's grandfather, whose name was Yuya. He was clearly not a Negro, but instead had straight hair, smaller lips, and a hook nose. This mummy evidence clearly refutes the lie the ancient Egyptians were Negro. Of relevance also is the ancient Egyptian statue of Queen Nefertiti, known as the Nefertiti Bust, created in 1345 BC. Egyptologist Frank Yurko explains this as, quote, the well-known head of Nefertiti in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin. There she is depicted with a blue cap-like crown and with light-colored skin. The color on the statue head is ancient, as originally applied by the sculptor, in whose studio the head was excavated. So this is how Nefertiti was actually represented in ancient times, end quote. Now, when this statue is compared to the average Negro today, or ancient depictions of Kushite or Nubian Negroes, there's a major difference. Clearly Nefertiti was not a Negro. We also have the Ka statue of Hor I, who was the Egyptian pharaoh of the 13th dynasty, reigning from 1777 BC until 1775 BC. He has non-Negroid features such as blue eyes, a small nose, and small lips. Thus, the argument that Moses and Jesus must have been Negro, because the ancient Egyptians were allegedly Negro, is refuted by the evidence. Now yes, from 760 BC to 656 BC, Egypt was temporarily ruled by six Kushite or Negro pharaohs in succession. This is called the 25th dynasty or the Kushite dynasty. As Edwin Yamauchi notes, for half a century a Kushite dynasty, the 25th, ruled Egypt. The most important ruler of this dynasty was Taharqa. W.Y. Adams comments, Taharqa was the next to last Ethiopian pharaoh. These Negro rulers came from the Nubian kingdom of Kush after its king, King Kashta, invaded Egypt and took control. The six Negro pharaohs did not come from Egypt, so it is erroneous to point to them and claim all native Egyptians were Negro. This Negro 25th dynasty was violently toppled and deposed by the Assyrians in 656 BC, and control of Egypt was then handed back to the native Egyptians. The last of the six Negro pharaohs, Tantamani, fled back to Nubia after this Assyrian toppling. Egyptologist Edna N. Russman notes concerning these temporary Negro pharaohs, quote, The newcomers did not look like Egyptians. Their skin was darker, their physiognomy that of the Sudan, end quote. Yamauchi adds, The Kushite rulers are depicted with darker chocolate brown color than the reddish brown Egyptians in the wall paintings of the Temple of Taharqa at Kasser Ibrim and also on a papyrus fragment. The confusion arises among fake black Israelites of today because they see ancient art and statues of these six temporary Negro foreign rulers or general artwork of Negroes who were a small minority in ancient Egypt and then they falsely conclude that all ancient Egyptians must have been Negro. However, as we've demonstrated, this is incorrect.
The ancient Egyptian word further land was kemet, which means the black. Fake black Israelites claim this is because the skin color of the ancient Egyptians was allegedly black. However, Egyptologist Herman Keyes notes, the black fertile soil gave Egypt its name Kemet, the black. The word does not have anything to do with skin color. Likewise, Professor of Old Testament Robert A. Bennett confirms, Egypt referred to herself as the black land, Kemet, alluding to the rich mud from the Nile inundations. The ever-enroaching desert was called the red land, Dashre, end quote. Another way fake black Israelites try to show the ancient Egyptians were Negro is they appeal to the writings of the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, who lived in the 5th century BC. In his work The History of Herodotus, he says people called the Colchians were Egyptians. Colchians were people who lived in what today is the country Georgia. Then fake black Israelites argue Herodotus described the Colchians as Negroes. Herodotus wrote, for the people of Colchis are evidently Egyptian, and this I perceived for myself before I hear it from others. They are dark-skinned and have curly hair. This of itself amounts to nothing, for there are other races which are so, but also still more because the Colchians, Egyptians, and Ethiopians alone, of all the races of men, have practiced circumcision from the first. However, Herodotus was not the most reliable when it came to his descriptions of other people's ethnic features. Consider his inaccurate claim that the semen of Indians and Ethiopians was black, like the color of their skin. Secondly, he was probably not even describing Colchians as Negroes. As historian of ancient Egypt, Simpson Najavitz observes, Had Herodotus wanted to designate the Colchians as blacks, and by extension designate the Egyptians as blacks, he would have named the Colchians by the standard Greek term Atho and Athiops, scorched faces Ethiopians. This is precisely what he did on several other occasions when he wanted to indicate that a people was of the black race, or what he thought was the black race. But not only did not he name the Colchians as Athiops, Ethiopians, in the same sentence, he once again distinguished between Egyptians and Ethiopians. In another quote from the same work, Herodotus refutes the idea the Nile River rose because of melting snow. He notes the Nile begins in places like modern Libya and Ethiopia, which are extremely hot, and then it travels to Egypt. And thus snow could not exist in hot places where the Nile originates. Fake black Israelites falsely claim he describes Egyptians as Negro here. Herodotus wrote, This way has no more truth in it than the rest, alleging as it does that the Nile flows from melting snow, whereas it flows out of Libya through the midst of the Ethiopians, and so comes out into Egypt. How then should it flow from snow when it flows from the hottest parts to those which are cooler, the people dwelling there, who are of a black color by reason of the burning heat? On this quote, fake black Israelites are incorrect. It is clear that here Herodotus is describing the Libyans and Ethiopians as being black from the burning heat, since they are from the area where the Nile flows from, that is the area where it would be impossible for snow to form the Nile River. He's not talking about Egypt, since the Nile does not flow from there, but instead, as he says, the Nile starts where it is burning hot, that is Libya and Ethiopia, and then travels to where it is cooler that is Egypt. Proponents of fake black Israelism, Anu Mbantu and Gert Muller, falsely claim that ivory heads from the Foss Temple in Lachish prove, quote, the ancient Hebrews were clearly black without question in hair and face. However, the ivory heads in question do not depict Hebrews or Israelites. The Foss Temple is actually a pagan Canaanite temple dated to the 15th or 16th century BC. At that period, the Canaanites lived in Lachish. The Israelites did not live there until the 10th century BC. Hence, these temple statuettes were not created by Israelites. So when these authors lie and use pictures of the Foss Temple ivory heads as evidence the Israelites were black, and even put pictures of them on the cover of their book as evidence, that is highly deceptive. 
This movement is based on lies and has no concern for truth. Anu Mbantu and Gert Muller also claim Genesis 28.11 proves Jacob was a Negro because in that text, Jacob allegedly used stones for pillows, which, according to them, would only work if Jacob had an afro to help lend further support. They claim this verse proves Jacob's hair was similar to that of the Sub-Saharans Africans. However, the text does not mention an afro, and based on the Hebrew text, many Old Testament scholars and translations affirm that Jacob used the stone not as a pillow, but instead as protection or self-defense, and placed it near his head in case he had to wake up and use it as a weapon and fight, or as a makeshift enclosure for his head for protection. The Hebrew word is mera asata, and many Old Testament scholars and translations translate it as he put it at his head place, as opposed to some who translate it as he put them for pillows. Old Testament scholar Victor P. Hamilton gives evidence for our reading. The same word occurs in verse 18, which says of Mera Asat, place at the head, head place. In addition to verse 18, see 1 Samuel 19, 13, 16, 26, 7, 1 Kings 19, 6. The stone more likely served as protection for his head rather than as a pillow. See 1 Samuel 26, 7, where Saul sleeps in a trench, with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. Now, Anu Mbantu and Gert Muller also claim the Leviticus 13 leprosy laws show that the ancient Israelites had black skin. They argue, the complexions white, dark white, and somewhat dark are contrasted with the Hebrew complexion because they are bright in relation. We are thus told that the Hebrews were neither white, nor dark white, nor somewhat dark. They're claiming since leprosy was said to cause discernible white spots, dark white spots, and somewhat dark spots, that must mean the skin color of the ancient Israelite was black and not any of these colors. Otherwise, such leprosy could not be detectable. However, due to the texture of leprosy, it's quite easy to detect on the human body, even if the color of the leprosy patch is the same as the color of the human body. So this argument holds no weight. A somewhat dark Middle Eastern brown Israelite could spot leprous, somewhat dark skin disease, even though it was the same color as them. Also, when verse 28 correlates the quote-unquote bright spot with the quote-unquote somewhat dark skin disease, this does not mean the somewhat dark skin disease was brighter than the Israelites' normal skin. That is, that the Israelites' skin must have been darker than quote-unquote somewhat dark. This is an erroneous argument since the original Hebrew word sometimes rendered as bright spot here is ha baheret and the NET Bible's notes explains it actually means shiny spot or white spot but to render this term white spot in this chapter would create redundancy end quote. Thus the fake black Israelite argument holds no weight. Fake black Israelites also appeal to Job 3030, which in the King James says, My skin is black upon me, and my bones are burnt with heat. However, the context here is Job suffering after being tested by God. When he says his skin is black upon him, the original Hebrew text refers to disease causing Job's skin to rot and fall off. The majority text says, Become dark from upon me, end quote. It is not saying he was naturally black. That's why the ESV renders it as, My skin turns black and falls from me. This is referring to the effects of the leprous boils Job was inflicted with in Job chapter 2. As Old Testament scholar Franz de Litch notes, For the first time he speaks of his disfigurement by leprosy in particular, My skin is become black from me i.e. being become black has peeled from me." End quote. Indeed, his skin was rotting off. Job 2, 7-8 talks about Job being inflicted with disease, whereby he used broken pottery to scrape off his rotting skin. That is all that is being talked about. It is not saying he was a Negro. Fake black Israelites also misuse Song of Solomon 1, 5-6, and claim that it shows Solomon was a Negro. It says, I am black, but calmly, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, 
as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards." End quote. However, here Solomon's wife is speaking, not Solomon. Moreover, it clearly says she was black because of suntan, not that she was naturally black. The reason she was so suntanned was because she had to work the vineyards for her brothers, verse 6. Thus, this is referring to suntan and not a negro complexion. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew verb shazaf, which means to look at, points to the woman personifying the sun as looking at her too long, thereby burning her skin. If you are born black, you don't need to be tanned by the sun to become blackened. An interesting text to discuss is Lamentations 4, 7-8 and 5:10. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. The context here is the distress of the Jews after the fall and destruction of Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 586 BC. This happened because of the immorality of the Jews. The text in question gives a contrast to how the nobles and commoners used to be compared to how they were after the fall. Old Testament scholar F.B. Huey notes the descriptions are dramatic hyperbole. When the people were not in sin and destruction, they were symbolically described as purer than snow and whiter than milk, verse 7. Then after their sin and destruction, they are described as having faces blacker than soot and not being recognizable in the streets, verse 8. This is clearly all symbolic exaggeration, denoting their extreme plight. Moreover, if we take it literally and affirm the people were actually turned black, why would they not be recognized in the streets, as verse 8 says? Wasn't black the color of all the Israelites naturally? The fact is, just as verse 8's description of their skin becoming as dry as wood is just a dramatic exaggeration, so is the description of their faces becoming blacker than soot, verse 8, or their skin becoming black like an oven, 510. The text is full of symbolism and exaggeration due to plight, and so to try to draw out literal descriptions of natural skin color is erroneous. Another text these groups abuse and misunderstand is Jeremiah 14, 2, which says, Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. The problem is the usual Hebrew word for black, i.e. shakor, isn't even used here. Instead, the word kadar is. Here this word refers to mourning in black clothing, that is the dress of a mourner, as the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew and English lexicon puts it. This was ancient Israel's custom, where they covered themselves with black sackcloth and ashes when mourning. As Old Testament scholar Charles L. Feinberg notes concerning this verse, the nation is clothed in black to express its mourning, end quote. Thus, the blackness here has nothing to do with skin color. Although fake black Israelites point to certain Egyptian art and claim the men and women have Negro hair, the fact is the ancient Egyptians wore specialized wigs, often braided wigs, and these groups confuse them with Negro hair. However, as the work Historical Wig Styling confirms, like Egyptian women, Egyptian men usually shaved their heads and wore wigs. Likewise, the work Empire of Ancient Egypt confirms, long braided wigs were very fashionable among the wealthy women of ancient Egypt. Both books provide ancient illustrations of such wigs to prove the point. Evidence Christ was not a Negro can be found in a fairly recent forensic anthropological study conducted by scientists and archaeologists such as expert in ancient facial reconstruction Richard Neve of the University of Manchester. Neve has helped reconstruct the faces of many ancient persons, including King Midas of 2000 BC, 
Nesiamun, the Egyptian mummy of 1100 BC, and Philip II of Macedon of 400 BC. The study took note of the fact that Jesus looked like an average Galilean Semite based on Matthew 26's discussion of Jesus' arrest. They then gathered ancient skulls from Jerusalem in order to study and determine the facial features of people of Jesus' time and area. They used various scientific techniques to create a 3D face. For example, they were able to accurately recreate the muscles and skin over the skull using forensic computer techniques. To determine Jesus' hair and skin color, they consulted relevant ancient art of Israelites. The study revealed that Jesus would have been an average-looking brown-skinned Middle Eastern Jew, and not a Negro. In the year 2000, James Tabar and archaeologist Shimon Gibson discovered a first-century tomb just south of Jerusalem, and in it they found first-century male Jewish hair. It is not Negro hair, but instead medium to short straight reddish hair. This again helps demonstrate the ancient Jews at Jesus' time were not Negroes. Moreover, Professor of Hebrew Literature Shea J.D. Cohen notes, Jews and Gentiles in antiquity were corporally, visually, linguistically, and socially indistinguishable. Even the sages of the Rabbinic Academy could not discern Romans in their midst. This means at the time of Christ, fair-skinned Romans could not be distinguished from the Jews. Thus, the ancient Israelites could not have been Negro. Cohen's source to prove this is the Sephre on Deuteronomy, codified around AD 300. This source reports a much earlier tradition that at the time of Rabbi Gamaliel in the first century AD, two Roman soldiers pretended to be Jews as inspectors and joined Gamaliel's Jewish school. Ancient Orthodox Jews, however, believed teaching Torah to Gentiles was forbidden and so the Roman soldiers must have visually blended in with these Jews at the school. The fact the ancient Orthodox Jews believed associating and visiting with Gentiles was forbidden is also confirmed in Acts 10.28. This material further demonstrates the ancient Jews at the time and location of Jesus were not Negro. Christ is a black man! Wait, give me a minute. So what the hell is wrong with you black men and women out there? Give me a minute. Christ is a black man! Elisha J. Israel writes, Probably the most telling indication of the color of Israel is John the Revelator's description of Jesus' hair texture and skin color. Jesus was and is dark-skinned. The text reads, His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. However, these are not literal descriptions. Revelation 1, 12-16 is a highly symbolic, apocalyptic vision of Christ. Firstly, in regards to Jesus being described as having feet like fine brass, this is symbolic and the meaning has roots in ancient Israelite culture. It is not a literal description of skin color. In the same verse, Christ's voice is said to be like the sound of many waters, and his eyes like fire. Just as these descriptions are not literal but symbolic, Jesus does not have literal feet like brass. Instead, New Testament and classic scholar Craigus Keener, who has a black wife by the way, and New Testament scholar Robert Mounts, both note that in ancient Jewish understanding, limbs being described as bronze or brass just symbolically denoted glory, strength, and stability, and had nothing to do with actual skin tone. Moreover, the brass or bronze does not symbolize black skin since verse 15 says the brass was as if refined in a furnace. When metals are refined in a furnace, they are glowing red or yellow, not black. In regards to Jesus' hair being described as white like wool, those who claim this refers to Negro hair miss the point. New Testament scholar Alan F. Johnson notes the reason Jesus' hair is described in this manner is because ancient Eastern countries believed aged or hoary grayish white hair represented wisdom and dignity. And the animal that had pure white hair they could point to as a symbol 
was the sheep which produced pure white wool. That's why the picture of woolly hair was used for Christ. Sheep's wool was the best example of pure white hair representing wisdom. It has nothing to do with Jesus having Negro hair. To further prove Revelation 1, 14-15 is symbolic and not literal, in the very next verse in Revelation 1, 16, Jesus is said to have a sword coming from his mouth. The same verse also says Jesus' face is like the sun, shining in full strength. Are we to take these things literally too? If we were, this must mean that Jesus was yellow or white, since that is the color of the sun shining in full strength, not black. Now, some fake black Israelites falsely claim a 3rd or 4th century Good Shepherd painting of Jesus from the Roman catacombs looks negroid. However, this is a fallacious argument. Scholars of early Christian art note there are over 80 of these Good Shepherd fresco paintings in the Roman catacombs, where Jesus is holding a lamb on his shoulders. For example, the Good Shepherd painting in the St. Callisto catacomb in Rome from the 3rd century depicts Jesus as an average-looking, brown-skinned, Middle Eastern Jew, and not a Negro. So it's disingenuous for fake black Israelites to pick one or two paintings out of 80 or so others in order to argue their case. Fake black Israelites also claim a painting from the catacombs of St. Domitilla show Jesus and the apostles were Negroid as well. However, upon close examination, their facial features do not actually appear Negro. Plus, there's another one called the Bust of Christ ceiling fresco in the catacombs of Comadilla in Rome that depicts Jesus as light-skinned. So why the selective appeal of only a few catacomb frescoes when there are over 80, many of which clearly contradict their argument? Most fake black Israelites are King James onlyists, even though this position has been refuted in many high-level academic works by people like Carson, Price, and White. But what is truly strange is the claim of the fake black Israelites that the man who authorized this translation, King James I, was a black Hebrew Israelite. The problem is, we have portraits of King James painted by people who knew him, proving he was white. For example, we have the paintings of John de Critz, who shortly after King James I became king in 1603, was appointed to be one of his portrait painters. When we examine Critz's eyewitness portraits, we clearly see King James was not a Negro. Moreover, we know from early paintings of King James' parents, Mary Queen of Scots and Henry Stuart, that they were Caucasian and not Negro either. So, what is the evidence fake black Israelites use to claim King James was a black guy? Firstly, they use a distorted, compressed, and blurry version of a painting of King James by Hendrik Hondius from 1608. However, if you look at the unedited, clear, original painting, it is obvious King James was not black. The original I am using was provided by the reputable art website, Mutual Art. Notice in the original, he has straight hair and Caucasian facial features. Also, although fake black Israelites falsely claim the word Jacobus in this painting means King James was descended from the biblical Jacob and was this part of the tribe of Judah, the fact is the reason the painting says Jacobus V is because the painter Hendrik Hondius was Dutch and the Dutch way of spelling James is Jacobus V. It has nothing to do with the biblical Jacob or the tribe of Judah. He was just spelling King James's name in Dutch. Fake black Israelites also appeal to the picture of King James on the cover of Thomas Hobbes' 1651 book, Leviathan. However, this is not an eyewitness picture. Moreover, upon close examination, King James does not even look Negro. He even has a handlebar mustache and wavy long hair, not an afro. Lastly, they appeal to a picture of King James in the 1616 book, Works of King James. However, anyone who thinks this is a black man has serious eye problems. Here, King James has a handlebar mustache and straight hair as well. This is clearly an old white guy. 
As supposed evidence African Americans are the true Israelites, fake black Israelites claim the Deuteronomy 28 curses apply to African Americans. Deuteronomy 28 affirms curses would be brought upon Israel if it was disobedient and violated the Mosaic Covenant. The curses include and relate to death, slavery, slave ships, Egypt, labor work, occupation, famine, and Israelites dispersing throughout the world, etc. Fake black Israelites falsely claim Deuteronomy 2868 predicts the transatlantic slave trade of the African Americans. However, there are many problems with this position. Firstly, the Deuteronomy 2836 curse was that the Israelites would be brought with their king to a foreign nation if they disobeyed. Africans were not brought to America with a king. On the other hand, during the Assyrian captivity of the Ten Tribes of Israel in 722 BC, the Israelite king Hoshea was taken captive with the Israelites. Also, when Babylon sieged Jerusalem and exiled the people of Judah in 586 BC, the Judite king of Israel, Zedekiah, was also exiled and brought with the Israelites. Thus, Deuteronomy 2836 was fulfilled by the ancient Judeans and Israelites, not African Americans. Secondly, scripture actually tells us this is when the Deuteronomy 28 curses were fulfilled, since referring to the Babylonian captivity, Zechariah 1.6, for example, says the Lord's commandments quote-unquote took over the Israelites. The Hebrew word for took over here is nasog, and it's the same word used in Deuteronomy 28, 15, and 45, when mentioning how the Israelites' failure to obey God's commands would lead to the Israelites being took over by curses. Same word used. This shows the Babylonian captivity was the fulfillment of the Deuteronomy 28 curses. Thirdly, referring to the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem and captivity in the 6th century BC, Lamentations 4.10 mentions how the Israelites were starving so bad they ate their own children. This fulfills the curse in Deuteronomy 28.53 which says, And you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you, in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies shall distress you. I am not aware of African Americans eating their children due to famine after first being sieged and occupied by Americans. Fourthly, Deuteronomy 28.63 refers to the Israelites being taken from Israel by a nation, not being taken from Africa or the land of Ham to the United States. It says, And you shall be plucked off the land that you are entering to take possession of it." End quote. In the Deuteronomistic historical context, the land the Israelites were entering and taking possession of here was the land of Canaan they would conquer and rename as Israel. Thus, it is impossible for this text to refer to African American slavery. Fifthly, fake black Israelites falsely claim Deuteronomy 2868 predicts Africans going on slave ships to America. Quote, And the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt i.e. the supposed symbolic America, a journey that I promise that you should never make again, and there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer." End quote. Commenting on this verse, fake black Israelite Elisha Israel writes, History undeniably reveals to us who was hoarded on ships and sold on auction blocks as bondmen and bondwomen, as is described in Deuteronomy 26.68. Only those stripped from Africa have endured being captured as slaves and transported by way of ships to the Americas, Europe, and Asia, end quote. However, this is historically incorrect. The ancient Jews were put on ships and sold as slaves throughout the world by the emperors Titus and Hadrian in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, and this is when the Deuteronomic curses were fully fulfilled. Here is the history. In AD 70, the Roman commander Titus, who would later become the emperor, amassed troops and invaded Jerusalem, destroying the temple and murdering and enslaving the Jewish population. This happened during the first Jewish war against the Romans, between AD 66 and 70, and it led to a great famine in Jerusalem, according to the ancient historian 
Josephus. This fulfills the hunger or famine curses in Deuteronomy 28.48. Also, Josephus tells us that due to this famine, the Jews were forced to survive by eating their own children, which fulfills the cannibalism curse in Deuteronomy 28.53. By the way, these famine curses were also fulfilled during the Babylonian captivity. Now, Roman commander Titus had 97,000 Jews enslaved and 1,100,000 Jews murdered in Jerusalem. Josephus informs us that those above the age of 17 years old were transported on ships to the Egyptian mines to do labor as slaves. This fulfills the slavery curse, which again says, and the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt. This text has nothing to do with Africans coming to America on ships. Those that were under 17 years old were sold as slaves, and many others were transported to other provinces as presents to be destroyed in gladiator games by the sword or by beasts. Something similar happened under Emperor Hadrian's Roman reign in the next century. After the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, slowly the city was rebuilt and many Jews returned to it. The Jews even built an altar on the destroyed Temple Mount, and thus temple ritual was temporarily reinstated. The Roman 10th Legion troops stayed in Jerusalem to keep order. Then a Jewish resistance arose called the Bar Kokhba Revolt, which led to another Jewish-Roman war, lasting between AD 132 and 136. The Romans decimated the Jews, murdering 585,000 of them. Fifty Jewish outposts and 985 villages were destroyed. These and the previous instances of Jerusalem's invasions and destruction fulfill the Deuteronomy 2852 curse, which again says, They shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls, in which you trusted, come down throughout all your land. This was not fulfilled in Africa. At this time, many Jews also died due to starvation from famine, and many were enslaved by Emperor Hadrian, who then banned all Jews from entering Jerusalem. Professor of Jewish History Shmuel Safre notes, Particularly notorious was the Terebinth Market north of Hebron, where Jewish slaves captured by Hadrian were sold in such large numbers that, according to one report, a Jewish slave could be bought for a horse's ration, end quote. This fulfills the Deuteronomy 2868 statement that, quote, There you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer, end quote. Were there no buyers of African-American slaves? No, there were many buyers. Likewise, George Williams notes at this time, many Jews, quote, were sold as slaves at Hebron or at Gaza, which hence received the name of Hadrian's Mart, while the remainder were transported to the slave markets of Egypt, and thence dispersed throughout the world, end quote. This dispersing of the Jews after being put in slave markets in Egypt fulfills the curse of Deuteronomy 2864, which says, Then the Lord will scatter you among all the nations, from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. This Deuteronomy scattering curse was also fulfilled during the Assyrian exile in 722 BC, where the ten lost tribes of Israel were scattered throughout the world. Thus, all the Deuteronomy 28 curses relating to death, slavery, slave ships, slavery in Egypt, labor work, occupation, famine, cannibalism, and Jews dispersing throughout the world were clearly fulfilled during these historical Jewish events we discussed, and not by African Americans who are not even Israelites. Fake black Israelism assumes there was Jewish mass migration to West Africa after the tribe of Judah was exiled and dispersed during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC and after the Jewish Roman Wars in AD 70 and 135. Fake black Israelites claim prior to being sold as slaves and brought to America, this supposed mass migration of Israelites to West Africa occurred so that later African-American slaves are the descendants of the tribe of Judah. However, there's no evidence for this. Therefore, the Africans who came to America as slaves were not the Jews. Instead, after the Babylonian exile, for example, many Judeans remained in Babylon to live 
and others returned to Israel. The rest were dispersed throughout the entire world in Mesopotamia, Arabia, Egypt, Asia Minor, Thrace, and Rome. They did not all just migrate to Africa as fake black Israelites assume. Based on the early evidence, Maristilla Bonacini and Zvi Ekstein note, in the first century, one million Jews lived in the Parthian Empire, one million in North Africa, mainly Egypt, between 200,000 and 400,000 in Syria and Lebanon, between 200,000 and 400,000 in Asia Minor, i.e. modern Turkey, and the Balkans, i.e. modern Albania, Bulgaria, Greece, and Yugoslavia, and another 100,000 to 200,000 lived in Western Europe, that is Italy, France, and the Iberian Peninsula. This is a very different picture than the false idea Judah just migrated to West Africa. Moreover, after the Jewish-Roman wars in the first and second centuries, the remaining Jews living in Jerusalem were also, quote, dispersed throughout the world, as George William notes, as opposed to West Africa. Now, although we have evidence of some migration of Jews to Northern Africa, mainly Egypt, the fact is the number of Jews living there evaporated as time went on. Bodicini and Eckstein note the leading scholars of ancient Jewish demography affirm that by the 7th century AD, these Jews who were originally 1 million in North Africa, mainly Egypt, reduced in size to, quote, no more than a few thousand, end quote. Since in the 7th century, records prove 75% of all Jews worldwide instead lived in Mesopotamia and Persia, not West Africa. The remaining 25% of Jews worldwide were in Europe, Israel, the Balkans, Asia Minor, and Lebanon, not West Africa. Indeed, in the 7th century, only 4,000 Jews remained in Africa. These 4,000 then expanded in size to around 30,000 by AD 1170. However, these Jews in Africa were then decimated due to plagues and famines in AD 1201 to 1202 as well as the Black Death in 1348, which continued to drastically reduce the Jewish population in Africa even into the 15th century. Given these facts, it's impossible to say the 400,000 or so West African slaves who were brought to America were the Jews of the tribe of Judah. There were just not enough Jews living in Africa during that time to make such an idea possible, and we know the Jews actually migrated around the world. Thus, it was actual West Africans who came to America as slaves, not Jews. This fact is confirmed by genetics research as well, which we will now discuss. A 2015 genetic study by K. Bryce et al. in the American Journal of Human Genetics using high-density genotype data showed African Americans show average proportions of 73.2% African, 24% European, and 0.8% Native American ancestry. Thus, African Americans do not have ancestry from Israel. Moreover, using genome-wide nuclear markers, a 2009 study by the University of Pennsylvania called the Genetic Structure and History of Africans and African Americans likewise revealed the ancestry of African Americans is predominantly from Niger Cordofanian, 71%, European, 13%, and other African 8% populations. It also revealed, quote, most African Americans are likely to have mixed ancestry from different regions of Western Africa, end quote. Hence, DNA evidence proves African Americans do not descend from Israel. They come from Africa. Fake black Israelites rely on and promote the outdated and debunked 1976 book the Thirteenth Tribe, written by Arthur Kessler. This book claims the modern Ashkenazi Jews of Israel and abroad who migrated from Europe after World War II do not actually descend from ancient Israelites in the Middle East, but instead Khazarian, i.e. Turkish people, who converted to Judaism in the 8th or 9th centuries in Europe. By clinging to this hypothesis, fake black Israelites claim they are justified in asserting that modern Jews in Israel and abroad 
are merely imposters and not real Jews. The problem is that Kessler's book has been refuted by academia and many recent genetic studies on Ashkenazi Jews. For example, in reviewing his book, the Kessler biographer David Cesarani notes it makes, quote, selective use of facts for a grossly polemical end, was risible as scholarship and was slaughtered by the critics, end quote. Moreover, in his biography of Kessler, Michael Scamell notes Kessler's theory, quote, was almost entirely hypothetical and based on the slenderest of circumstantial evidence, end quote, and takes the book as evidence that Kessler's brain, quote, was starting to fail him, end quote. The theory that the Ashkenazi Jews came from the Turkic Khazars in Europe and not real Jews has been soundly refuted by historian and professor Zvi and Kori in his detailed 1979 response essay. The theory was also refuted more recently in a 2013 essay by professor of Soviet and East European Jewry, Shaul Stamfer, entitled, Did the Khazars Convert to Judaism? Stamfer disproves the theory, noting, The view that some or all the Khazars, a Central Asian people, converted to Judaism at some point during the 9th or 10th century is widely accepted. A careful examination of the sources, however, shows that some of them are pseudepigraphic and the rest are of questionable reliability. Many of the most reliable contemporary texts that mention Khazars say nothing about their conversion, nor is there any archaeological evidence for it. This leads to the conclusion that such a conversion never took place. He goes into detail in the essay. What is more, Professor of Jewish Studies Fred Astrin likewise notes Kessler's book is, quote, outlandish speculation, unquote, end quote. The Khazar theory is widely held by scholars to be ahistorical, end quote. What about genetics? Well, the largest genetic study on Jews conducted in 2013 by Wayne State University revealed that Jews today in Israel and abroad who came from Europe after World War II have no detectable Khazar origins and instead derive their ancestry from Middle Eastern and European populations. Moreover, in his 2012 book, Legacy, A Genetic History of the Jewish People, geneticist Harry Oster provided 20 years of genetics research conducted by him and many other scientists and concluded the major Jewish groups share common Middle Eastern origin and no large-scale genetic contribution from the Turkic Khazars. What is more, appealing to autosomal DNA research, science writer Nicholas Wade notes, Ashkenazic and Sephardic Jews have roughly 30% European ancestry, with most of the rest from the Middle East, end quote. Thus, DNA proves the Ashkenazi Jews are the true descendants of the ancient Israelites from the Middle East. They are not imposters. Fake black Israelites are the imposters. As supposed evidence, the Ashkenazi Jews living in Israel and abroad are not actually ethnically linked to the ancient Israelites. The fake black Israelites misuse Revelation 2.9 and 3.9, which talk about the synagogue of Satan, which the Bible identifies as those who say they are Jews but are not. However, these two texts in Revelation were written to first century Christians in Smyrna and Philadelphia concerning Jews who lived among them. These Jews there slandered and persecuted the first century Christians in those cities. It's not about Jews today. Those Jews collaborated with local Roman officials to persecute Christianity, putting Christians in prison. Keener notes, Roman officials normally depended on informers as accusers before they would prosecute a case, and this was true of prosecution of Christians in Asia Minor in the decades immediately following Revelation's publication. Revelation 2.9's mention of poverty also points to these Jews being responsible for the economic troubles of the Christians in first century Smyrna and Philadelphia. Hence, to misunderstand these two texts in Revelation as if they apply to Ashkenazi Jews living today demonstrates a fundamental inability to interpret scripture in its historical first century context. In light of the actions of these first century accusers and persecutors in these cities, they were said to be lying when they called themselves Jews. What does this mean? 
Well, the point is not that they were lying about their national descent. Instead, the same theme is treated in Romans 2, 28-29, which says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit. In other words, it's not enough to be a physical Jew or descendant of Judah. One has to prove themselves with their actions to truly be considered a Jew in God's eyes. Thus, these first century Jews in Smyrna and Philadelphia, although physical Jews descended from Judah, demonstrated they could not truly call themselves Jews due to the way they persecuted Christians. The point is not that they were of some other ethnicity. As New Testament scholar Robert Mounts notes, regardless of their national descent, they had become, by their bitter opposition to the church and its message, a synagogue carrying out the activities of God's supreme adversary, Satan. Or, as New Testament scholar Leon Morris notes, to be a Jew means more than to possess outward membership of the race. In order to try to prove the Bible predicts the awakening and regathering of African American fake Israelites, these cults point to texts like Ezekiel 34, 11 to 12, 37, 21 to 22, and Jeremiah 23, 5-8. Such texts mention the return of the exiled and globally dispersed Israelites back to Israel. In the case of Jeremiah 23, 5-8, the regathering in Israel is said to happen after Christ's first century advent. So who is the group who fulfills this and regathered to Israel after Jesus' advent? Was it the fake black Israelites? No. They're still in America, fighting amongst themselves, believing all kinds of different things. No, it was the real Jews who in 1948 were given their land back in an amazing episode of history. At this recreation of the state of Israel, we saw mass migration of the real Jews back to Israel in direct fulfillment of these prophecies. Meanwhile, fake black Israelites missed out because they aren't real Jews. They are in no position to regather and unite, migrating to Israel together. This is because they are still fighting with each other in dozens of theologically different camps in the United States. Biblical scholar Ron Rhodes notes the aforementioned biblical material, quote, portrays Israel as becoming a living, breathing nation, brought back from the dead, as it were. The year 1948 was pivotal in this regard. In AD 70, Titus and his Roman warriors trampled on and destroyed Jerusalem definitively ending Israel as a political entity. For many centuries since then, the Jews have been dispersed worldwide. Israel achieved statehood in 1948, and the Jews have been returning to their homeland ever since. The vision of Ezekiel 37 is coming to pass, just as predicted. Ariah, one of the original leaders of the ISUPK school, invented the 12 tribes of Israel chart that fake black Israelites use today. Many fake black Israelite websites display this chart as if it was factual. By the way, Arya again is the one who introduced the doctrine of reincarnation to the school, and he's the one who falsely predicted Jesus would return in the year 2000 and kill and enslave all white people. Well, there are serious problems with his widely used 12 tribes chart as well. The chart falsely claims the ten lost tribes of Israel, exiled and dispersed by the Assyrians in the 8th century BC, became people groups such as the Mexicans, Cubans, American Indians, Dominicans, Haitians, Puerto Ricans, Argentinians, etc. Do you know your nationality? Did you just come, came up here? Okay. What, what, are you, what is your father, so to speak? What would your father be classified as? Father, father. But I'm saying, what, is he Puerto Rican? Is he Jamaican? Is he West Indian? Is he Trinidad? West Indian. Okay, well, so you would be of the tribe of Benjamin on this board right here. Yeah. Okay? That would, that would be you. However, there is no meaningful evidence for these claims. There is actually evidence against these claims. A Jewish traveler in the 800s AD named Eldad Hadani visited a Jewish community in Tunisia claiming he was a member of the Lost Tribe of Dan and that he had insight into the locations of the Lost Tribes of Israel. 
His claim can be found in the work Sefer Eldad, as well as a letter by the Jews of Tunisia he visited, written to Rabbi Zema Gaon in the 9th century. These documents reveal Eldad claimed to be of the tribe of Dan, and that Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher had migrated to the borders of the river of Sambation in the land of Cush or Ethiopia. That Eldad was truthful about his origins is affirmed by the Oxford Dictionary of the Jewish Religion, which notes, Scholars postulate on linguistic grounds and internal evidence that Eldad originated among the Jews of Ethiopia. If Eldad was indeed correct, then fake black Israelites are refuted on their claims that Neftali migrated to Argentina and Chile, that Gad migrated to North America as Indians, and that Asher migrated to Colombia and Uruguay. Such claims would indeed be shown to be false. Moreover, during his travels, Eldad claimed to have encountered the tribe of Issachar in the land of the Medes and Persians. He also noted the tribe of Zebulon lived in the mountains of Paran, and that the tribe of Reuben lived opposite of them, behind the mountains of Paran. If this is true, then fake black Israelites are incorrect when they claim the tribe of Issachar migrated to Mexico and became the Mexicans, that Reuben became the Seminole Indians, and that Zebulon migrated to Guatemala and Panama. Eldad also affirmed the tribes of Simon, Manasseh, and Ephraim were in the mountains of Arabia and Khazaria, which, if true, means fake black Israelites are incorrect when they claim Simon became the Dominicans, that Manasseh became the Cubans, and that Ephraim became the Puerto Ricans. Indeed, if Eldad is right, such claims would be false. The following are some reasons to accept Eldad's main claims as reliable. In the book, The Ten Lost Tribes, the Charles River editors note it does appear Eldad encountered Issachar and learned from them about the neighboring Reuben and Zebulon tribes who lived close by in the mountains of Paran, and that if he were fabricating his information about the other tribes in Arabia and Khazaria, quote, one would think that his claims might be more exaggerated than what he presented. What is more, Barry Stifle informs us there is Ethiopian evidence corroborating Eldad's claims concerning his purported tribe of origin, the tribe of Dan. Quote, there are local legends and an oral tradition that corroborates a Beta Israel, Ethiopian Jewish origin from the tribe of Dan. So strong is such evidence that in 1973, a rabbinic ruling from Israel declared there were many Ethiopians who were indeed children of the tribe of Dan. Then in 1975, the Israeli government officially accepted these Ethiopians of the tribe of Dan as Jews, and thus, in the 1980s and 90s, the Jewish state brought thousands of them to live in Israel. This, by implication, helps legitimize Eldad's claims of the location of the lost tribes. In sum, although African Americans are not the tribe of Judah, and the ten lost tribes did not migrate where fake black Israelites say they did, it does appear many Ethiopian Africans descend from the tribe of Dan. Now, the founder of the fake black Israelite schools, Eber Ben Yamyan, also known as Abba Bivens, taught that American Indians were Israelites. Today, fake black Israelites claim American Indians are the tribe of Gad, according to the Ten Lost Tribes chart. However, the first comprehensive treatise arguing this position in English comes from 1648 and was written by the Puritan Thomas Thorogood. He argued since Native Americans were quite easy to convert to Christianity, that must mean they were members of the Lost Ten Tribes and had an ingrained spiritual element that could be seized upon. However, this is not decisive proof. As time went on, the theory became somewhat popular, leading to biblical scholars like Thomas Jefferson and others, examining it eventually leading to the theory's refutation and abandonment among serious academics. As Zvi Bendor Benit notes, more and more evidence based on increasingly sophisticated and less passionate ethnography pointed to the simple reality, the Indians were not Israelites. This was, as Popkin stated, one of the most important reasons that the Jewish Indian theory eventually died. There was simply no plausible evidence for this claim. The only real evidence found in America was a strange earthwork, a mound, discovered in Philadelphia in 1772, which for a while was taken to be the work of the Ten Lost Tribes. 
the debate gradually dissipated as increasingly sophisticated archaeological and ethnographic research tied it to known Native American practices, end quote. Even though the theory was refuted and there's no meaningful evidence for it, Abba Bivens and the fake black Israelites still nevertheless adopted it. After the theory was dismissed by the academic world, some fringe writers since then, as well as the satanic Mormon church, also adopted it and put out publications trying to argue for it. However, for a refutation of the theory written by a former Mormon bishop and molecular scientist using DNA evidence, see Simon G. Southerton's book, Losing a Lost Tribe, where he concludes that there's no evidence of Israelite descent among American Indians. His research showed a 98.6% Asian DNA connection and a 0% Middle Eastern DNA connection for American Indians. Indeed, American Indians come from the Asian peoples and are not of the tribe of Gad. Isaac's son Esau was the progenitor of the Edomites. Fake black Israelites falsely claim Esau and the Edomites were Caucasian. They also argue that since God hated Esau according to Malachi 1.3 and Romans 9.13, God therefore hates the white race as well. However, there are two major problems with this thesis. First, Esau or the Edomites were not the progenitors of the white race. The Edomites moved to the southern hill country of Judea after the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem and exile of the Jewish people in 586 BC. Then in 163 BC, these Edomites who became known as the Edomians were subdued under the rule of the Jewish Maccabees and then again by the Maccabean John Hyrcanus in 125 BC, leading to the Edomites converting to Judaism and becoming distinct members of the Jewish nation who lived in their own colonies in the southern hill country of Judea. In the first century AD, the Edomites joined the Jews in rebellion against Rome and were obliterated with only a few remaining refugees escaping. This is the actual history of the Edomites, and there is thus no way they were the progenitors of white people today. They got destroyed and then disappeared from history. These facts also refute the fake black Israelite lie proposed by Elisha J. Israel that the post-exilic Edomites took over the Jews as impostors and were thus the descendants of modern Ashkenazi Jews. That is incorrect. After being conquered by the Maccabeans, they were in discernible separate colonies than the first century Jews. This is why the ancient historian Josephus was able to distinguish the Jews from the Edomites when he wrote about first century Jewish events. The Edomites did not take over the Jews as impostors. So where do whites come from if not from Esau and his Edomite descendants? There's evidence Noah's son Japheth was instead the progenitor of the white race. Harold Hunt and Russell Grigg wrote an in-depth essay called The Sixteen Grandsons of Noah, where they demonstrate Japheth is the true ancestor of the whites, not Esau. And Esau came from Noah's son Shem, not Noah's son Japheth. These authors note Japheth's son Gomer had descendants called the Gomerites who first lived in Galatia and thus became known as the Gauls. These Gomerites or Gauls then migrated to modern day France and Spain. For a long time, France was therefore called Gaul, named after these Japhethite peoples. Moreover, the Gomerites also migrated to modern day Wales, which is in southwest Great Britain. We know this because the Welsh language is called Gomerag and because of ancient traditions that Gomer's descendants came to Britain. Gomer's sons Ashkenaz and Tagarma then populated Germany and Armenia. Indeed, Ashkenaz is the Hebrew word for Germany. What is more, Japheth's son Magog had descendants who populated Romania and Ukraine. We know this because Josephus tells us the Magogites were known as Scythians, and ancient Scythia was located in modern-day Romania and Ukraine. Also, Japheth's son Meshach had descendants who populated modern-day Russia. Meshach indeed means Moscow. Hence, whites do not come from Esau. 
they come from Japheth. So this idea whites are cursed or devil Edomites is historically inaccurate. Second, although later in scripture God affirms he hated Esau, nevertheless we see earlier evidence in the book of Deuteronomy of God actually giving land to Esau and his progeny, the Edomites, and even helping them defeat their enemies, similar to how God helped Israel militarily and gave them land. This means God did not view Esau as an inherently evil, cursed devil race, as fake black Israelites claim. For example, in Deuteronomy 2, 4-5 and 21-22, we read that God gave Esau Mount Seir as their possession, and even helped them defeat the Horites in order to obtain it. You are about to pass through the territory of your brothers, the people of Esau who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you, so be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. The Lord destroyed them, i.e. the Rephaim people, before the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, as he did for the people of Esau, who live in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, even to this day. So if Esau was an inherently cursed, evil devil race, why did God help them defeat the Horites and give them their land? Moreover, King Saul hired an Edomite named Doeg to be the chief of his herdsmen, would Saul hire an Edomite to this position, if it was known by the Israelites that Edomites were cursed and the devil? Also, although fake black Israelites hate whites and call them Edomites, often cursing at them in the streets, Deuteronomy 23.7 explicitly warns, quote, You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. Hence, this theology of hate fake black Israelites teach against whites is unbiblical. You ready to kill little Edomite families? Y'all gonna get put to death, man! That's right! You gonna die, you and your little ugly kids! With all of this evidence against the fake black Israelite theory on Esau, all they are left with is the argument that since Esau was said to be red and hairy in Genesis 25-25, this must mean he was a hairy Caucasian and the progenitor of the white race. However, when Esau is described as red here, the Hebrew word as Admonai, the same word is used in 1 Samuel 16.12 and 17.42 to describe King David's skin complexion. 1 Samuel 17.42, for example, says, And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy, admonite, and handsome in appearance. The same Hebrew word is used, so if red actually meant Esau was a Caucasian, then David must have been Caucasian too and thus fake black Israelism is refuted. But the fact is, Rudy does not mean Esau and David were Caucasian. Instead, it simply refers to reddish brown skinned Middle Eastern people. Most fake black Israelites teach that Gentiles cannot be saved and that Gentiles should all instead be hated. This is their way of getting back at white people. However, this position is incompatible with scripture. They appeal to Matthew 10, 5-6, which says, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, end quote. However, it is erroneous for fake black Israelites to assume that just because at this early period Jesus instructed his disciples to preach only to the Jews, that this meant this was Jesus' permanent plan. Instead of this representing Jesus and the disciples' long-term mission, Leon Morris notes, All this means is that on this first mission, the twelve were to work in Galilee. The roads to the north and east led to Gentile territory, while that to the south went to Samaria. R.T. France likewise notes, The geographical terms used here, Way of the Gentiles, Town of the Samaritans, indicate a restriction on the area to be visited, rather than a total ban on contact with Gentiles and Samaritans as such. This limited scope of mission was to apply for the initial period of proclamation until the undeniably primary focus of Jesus' mission as Messiah of Israel had been established. Only after that, and after his death and resurrection, 
would it be appropriate to widen the scope deliberately to include Gentile and Samaritan areas? Twelve verses later, we see recognition the disciples would eventually be going out to the Gentiles. Quote, You will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. End quote. The fact is, if Jesus went to the Gentiles at the same time as the Jews in the beginning of the mission, instead of going to the Jews first, he would unnecessarily offend his Jewish people, who anxiously expected their king to fulfill their history and show special care for them. Thus, this was Jesus' first mission. Then afterwards, he sent his disciples to go to the Gentiles. This the Apostle Paul well understood when he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek." End quote. Let us now discuss that second stage of the mission. In Matthew 28, 18-19, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells his followers to make disciples of all the nations, ethnos in the Greek. In Romans 9.24, the same Greek word is used and is translated as Gentiles, quote, Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. These kinds of texts refute fake black Israelism. However, fake black Israelites deviously respond by claiming that when the salvation of ethnos, i.e. nations or Gentiles, is discussed in such passages, Israelites living in foreign nations are actually in view, as opposed to actual Gentiles. However, this position is refuted by a number of considerations. For example, based on Peter receiving a vision from God in Acts 10, 10 to 15, Acts 10, 34 to 35 explicitly affirms salvation is open to all Gentiles, not just the idea of Israelites in foreign lands, quote, So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him, end quote. The context of this text concerns a Gentile named Cornelius who worshipped Yahweh and was accepted by him and the Apostle Peter. Further proof this man was a true Gentile is that Cornelius is a Latin name, and he was a Roman centurion of the Italian cohort stationed in Caesarea. It does not get more Gentile than that. Moreover, in the Old Testament there are texts affirming non-Israelite foreigners living among the Israelites were under Mosaic law and thus part of the Mosaic Covenant. This means they could be saved by adhering to Mosaic Covenant. Exodus 12.49 affirms, If a stranger shall sojourn with you, and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. The same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you." End quote. Clearly this is referring to true Gentiles coming into the fold of the Israelites, since their families are to become circumcised. Old Testament scholar Walter Kaiser points out that in context, these strangers who were sojourning among the Israelites were of, quote, the mixed multitude who came out of Egypt with Israel and all such persons who might join them from time to time. Hence, there's no doubt these are non-Israelites. J. Daniel Hayes asks, what are the implications of the term translated as a mixed crowd? The clear stress of the Hebrew term used, Ereb, is that these people were non-Israelites. Enns writes that this term indicates an ethnic mixture of peoples, end quote. Also, in Revelation 7, 4-9, at the end of the tribulation and at Christ's return, 144,000 people from the 12 tribes of Israel are saved, as well as a countless multitude of Gentiles from every nation, people, tribe, and language. Thus, Gentiles can be saved, not just members of the twelve tribes. This is explicit. Lastly, although many people think the end of Mark 16 is inauthentic, the fact is fake black Israelites believe it is authentic, as do a number of scholars based on a recent book called The Original Ending of Mark by Nicholas P. Lunn, arguing for its authenticity. 
And in Mark 16, 15, Jesus explicitly says, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, end quote. Notice the whole creation, not just Israelites. And all you so-called white people, you're the devil, right? That's right! God, right. right. we gonna destroy you, right? That's right. Have your last days of enjoying America. It's the most high is about to put your ass in slavery, and you're gonna use us to do it. That's, That's right. right! You little red punks, all right? That's according to the Bible. They claim Revelation 3.9 supports the idea of whites being slaves of blacks in the future kingdom, since it says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not but lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, end quote. However, we already demonstrated earlier this text refers to Jews in first century Smyrna and Philadelphia, who persecuted Christians in those cities. And although they were ethnically Jewish, their actions forfeited them from being considered true Jews. The text is saying unbelieving Jews will one day bow before Messiah's people and learn that God loves Messiah's congregation. What many scholars feel is in view is Paul's Romans 11 statement that all Israel will be saved. That is, the majority of unbelieving Jews will be saved and recognize Messiah, at the same time paying homage to the Christians who believed in Messiah prior to them. Indeed, Romans 11, 26-28 affirms that unbelieving Israel will be saved, and that although right now they are enemies of the gospel, nevertheless in regards to election, they are beloved by God for the sake of their believing Jewish forefathers. This is what is most likely in view here, when Revelation 3.9 says unbelieving Jews will one day pay homage and bow to Messiah's people. Not this crazy idea of slavery. Fake black Israelites also claim the dragon or Satan of Revelation 12, 13, 16, and 20 is the white man. And that since Revelation 22 says the dragon was bound for a thousand years, this must mean whites will be bound with chains and made slaves of fake black Israelites for a thousand years in the future millennial kingdom. As for Revelation 22 to 3 saying that an angel will bind Satan for a thousand years so he can no longer deceive the nations, this is not about the white man. We know this is about an actual celestial angelic figure being bound, since, as New Testament scholar Craig Keener notes, the idea of binding an evil angel appears regularly in Jewish texts. Thus, in one widely read Jewish work, God commands an archangel to bind and so immobilize a leader of rebellious angels until he will be cast into the fire on the Day of Judgment. Likewise, another Jewish work written some two centuries before Revelation recounts good angels binding evil angels until the Day of Judgment. Hence, when we go back to the cultural thought world of the book of Revelation, we see ancient Jewish textual evidence that Satan being bound by an angel means Satan is an actual angelic celestial being, and not the white race. Fake black Israelites also claim that when the book of Obadiah talks about Edom and its fall, it is talking about white America's future rise and collapse, and that all white people will be destroyed by God and the fake black Israelites. To argue their case, they note about Edom, verse 4 says, You soar aloft like the eagle. Since one of America's common symbols is the eagle, they argue this is proof white America is being discussed. However, this is not decisive, and biblical history refutes this theory. The book of Obadiah is a hostile oracle against the Edomites. Contrary to the fake black Israelite claim that the hostility is due to whites enslaving African Americans, it is actually because of Edom's harsh treatment toward ancient Israelites in antiquity. For example, Edom refused to let Israel pass through Edomite territory on their way from Egypt to the land of Canaan. Saul and King David both fought against Edom, and Edom betrayed Judah when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem and exiled the Jews in 586 BC. Due to such actions, Obadiah predicted the destruction of Edom, and such predictions of destruction have already been fulfilled in history. They are not about white people or America today. Obadiah 1.4 predicts Edom would be brought down, and verses 5-7 to predict Edom would be ransacked, pillaged, deported and betrayed by their allies. These things were all fulfilled when the Babylonian ruler, Nabonidus, who reigned from 555 to 539 BC, 
first allied with Edom and then turned his back on them. Edom's final destruction as a kingdom happened in the 5th century BC when the Nabataean Arabs conquered them and occupied their land. Also, verses 18 and 19 and 21 predict the house of Esau would be made stubble and that the people from the Negev, that is Jews in southern Judah, would then become masters of the mountains of Esau. In history, the Jews of Negev did control the mountains of Esau in fulfillment of this Obadiah prophecy. The post-exilic region of Judah did not extend beyond Beth Zur, north of Hebron. Hebron and the neighboring towns in the Negev were all occupied by Edomites. But the Maccabean Wars in the second century BC led to the Israelites conquering the Edomites living there and then controlling their land in direct fulfillment of this prophecy. Fake black Israelites also claim Isaiah 14 1-2 supports their idea of murdering and enslaving whites in the future kingdom of God. For the Lord will have compassion on Jacob, and will again choose Israel, and will set them in their own land, and sojourners will join them and will attach themselves to the house of Jacob, and the peoples will take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel will possess them in the Lord's land as male and female slaves. They will take captive those who were their captors and rule over those who oppressed them." End quote. However, Isaiah was written in the 8th century BC, and in ancient context, Isaiah 13, 1 to 14:23 is a prophecy against ancient Babylon regarding its judgment and destruction, and how the ancient Jews would return to Israel from Babylonian exile. This was fulfilled when Persian King Cyrus the Great destroyed Babylon in 538 BC. These Persians then ended the Jewish exile in 515 BC, leading to many of the Jewish exiles returning to Jerusalem in direct fulfillment of this Isaiah prophecy. And as for Isaiah 14, 1-2 saying sojourners would join the Israelites and come to Jerusalem and be possessed by the Israelites? Ezra 1, 1-4 and 6, 1-12 explain this and note Cyrus king of Persia decreed that when the Jews left Babylonian exile and went back to Jerusalem, non-Israelite neighbors were to help the Jews return and rebuild Jerusalem with them, and in that sense be utilized or possessed by Israel. Lastly, fake black Israelites appeal to the invalid Old Testament apocryphal book 2 Ezra 6, 8-9, in order to claim the final kingdom of God and fake black Israelites will destroy the Caucasian Edomite kingdom led by America, and that the kingdom of Jacob or fake black Israelites will replace it, quote, And he said unto me, From Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hand held first the heel of Esau, for Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. However, no scholars who study this text see Esau as a reference to all white people led by America. Instead, most scholars note 2 Ezra 6, 8-10 derives from the aftermath of the destruction of 70 CE. In her commentary on 2 Ezra's, Robin Darling Young agrees. We know this because the work is not alluded to before the 2nd century AD, and because, like the book of Revelation, written near the same time, it often equates Babylon with Rome. So in light of the date and reason of writing, most scholars conclude in this text Esau is being equated with the ancient Roman Empire, which recently destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. The conclusion is the future fall of the Roman Empire would lead to the new age or world of Israel's kingdom reign. Thus, this has nothing to do with all white people or America. The point is, a first century Jew angry at Rome after the destruction of Jerusalem predicted Rome would one day collapse, and he pretended to be Ezra writing 400 years earlier in order to get his point across. The first century rabbi Akiva likewise connected Esau to the Roman Empire, and so such a connection existed in the days of second Ezra's composition. Many fake black Israelites teach the false Hindu doctrine of reincarnation, and they misuse a few biblical texts to do so. For example, they note how in Malachi 4.5, there's a prediction that God would send Elijah the prophet who was already ascended and in heaven. And in the Gospels, the people wondered if Jesus was John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. 
However, this is not affirming reincarnation. Luke 1.17 explains John the Baptist fulfilled the Malachi 4.5 Elijah prediction since he walked, quote, in the spirit and power of Elijah, end quote. Indeed, such texts are not about reincarnation, but instead resembling past prophets in spirit and power. What does in spirit and power mean? Robert H. Stein notes, There is a close tie between spirit and power in Luke Acts, and when power is mentioned, one can usually assume that it is the spirit who is empowering. Indeed, by operating in the Holy Spirit with power, John the Baptist fulfilled the role of Elijah, having similar roles even though he was not the literal reincarnation of Elijah. Hence, John the Baptist can be described by Christ as the Malachi 4-5 fulfillment of Elijah in spirit and power, and at the same time, John the Baptist can also deny he is Elijah, that is, deny he is the literal physical Elijah in John 1:21. This is because reincarnation is not in view, and John the Baptist was denying that understanding. Despite possible misunderstandings of the crowds of Jesus' day, the theology in the ancient Jewish sources was not that Elijah would reincarnate into a new human body as another person, but that after ascending to heaven in 2 Kings 2.11, he existed with the ranks of angels, often coming down to earth to help people, and that he would come back to earth as himself and the forerunner to the day of the Lord. Hence, not even the ancient Jewish sources support reincarnation. In fact, reincarnation is explicitly refuted by Hebrews 9.27, which says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Notice people die once, they are not reincarnated, which would mean they die more than once. And after death they are judged, not reincarnated. Thus, when fake black Israelite leaders claim to be Moses, David, John the Revelator, or the Holy Spirit reincarnated, that is an unbiblical pagan Hindu concept. Many people who study fake black Israelism conclude this movement emerged because African Americans felt negatively about how their ancestors were treated so lowly as slaves. And this is indeed a horrible thing that happened. To try to reverse this damage and renew the confidence of the African-American spirit, these fake Israelite groups emerged, teaching they were not just mere descendants of lowly slaves. Instead, they were God's special people, the Israelites, who would one day take revenge on their captors. Instead of tracing their roots back to tribal voodoo and face painting in Africa, which would not boost their confidence the way they wanted, they instead stole the identity of the ancient Israelites in an attempt to heal their historical wounds and boost their pride. Nevertheless, as we've shown, the fake black Israelites are not the true Israelites. Fake black Israelites are in reality Cushite or Nubian Gentiles. But the good news is one does not have to be an Israelite to be special in God's eyes and have a relationship with God. Christ died for the sins of everyone who would come to him and repent and believe. Then their sins are forgiven and they have eternal life. Jesus' sacrifice was an atonement. Once one is born again, they will realize there is no place for racism in Christ. Skin color must not be one's religion or idol. Our focus should instead be on Christ. There are great African and African American Christian scholars and leaders to learn from if one wants to transition from fake black Israelism to biblical Christianity, such as Vadi Bakum, H.B. Charles Jr., Shai Lin, Conrad Mabui, Tafik Kotman L., Charles Cooper, Ken Jones, avoid heretical megachurches and instead find a good reformed Baptist church. They make good homes for new converts to Christianity who are interested in biblical truth.